Welcome back, everybody, to the hands of the Thank you, Tess. Uh, yeah, I'm going to sit down for a bit <laughs> and talk. Don't worry. I'm just going <laughs> So, thinking about the best way of doing this, I think if I briefly talk you through the first few exercises just to get, get the swimming. API juices flowing, I guess, is that a thing? Um, and then I'll, I'll sort of give a few more slides on, on some of the specific tools. Um, so we've sort of developed them to make some of these things a lot easier. But then it's going to kind of be free reign, I guess. So the, the, the tutorials are quite open-ended. I'd be interested, you know, to sort of people shouting out the kind of thing they'd want to use this for, if, if at all. Uh, or, or maybe if they don't want to use it, why they wouldn't want to use it, what, what thing isn't being served by, um, by what, we, what we've come up with. Um, but hopefully there are some sort of more slightly more formulaic examples from the two particular databases so aflow and oqmd one that even does some machine learning which i told you wasn't going to happen but those ones i mean i, I haven't done what you did so you can just sort of run every cell i'm afraid um because it'll be quite a lot of effort to sort of memorize this, this many exercises but at the very end i'll, I'll sort of go through Probably the one that's most relevant to me is this Optimate Python tools thing, which I haven't spoken about at all yet. Um, which, as I say, I'll, I'll introduce after I go through these first exercises. So, can you just give me a moment? Where it was. So, I'm just going to go to the the GitHub repository for the exercises. I, I guess you've been given this link, but I'll put it in the chat in case anyone hasn't. Um, I guess you, the, the link can be found also on the web page under tutorials and media. Thank you. <laughs> can, can, do the people online hear that? So it's, I, I hope so. I think you <laughs> did. Uh, yeah, you can just type it in Zoom. Yes, I'll type it. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's, okay, well, there's, a, there's this GitHub repository. You can, you can see it even if you don't have access to it. Um, well, it's public, so just just follow the link. Um, and the way it's laid out at the moment, the README basically contains everything you need, including links out to particular exercises if they're in separate notebooks. Um, you'll see that this was actually also developed, so not just by myself, but a few other people I'll just acknowledge. So uh, Matt Horton, at, well, formerly at LBNL, I think he's still there. In the meantime, uh, contributed the Pymat Gen exercise. Uh, Evgeny Blokin of Tilda Informatics uh, did a lot of sort of reviewing of the, the text. Uh, Cormac Toa, who is now actually, this is out of date, is now a uh, professor in Texas, um, contributed the AFLO exercise. Uh, Abby from Northwestern contributed to the exercise. And Johan, who is the, the sort of CCAM Optimate postdoc at the moment, uh, did a lot of the testing. So I, you know, I can't take credit for all of this. Um, so I, was, I would suggest, you know, maybe just take a few minutes just to read through this intro. It's probably not much more beyond what I've already given in the slides, um, but it provides you some links up to some tools you might want to use, just generic things like curl, or wget, and jq. Um, if you already have a tool in mind, if you know you're going to use PyMetGen, you know you're going to use ASC or whatever, then just sort of jump straight in with that. There's also two sort of web clients that you could have a play around with. They, Worked last time I gave the tutorial, but I guess they're not under my control, so I can't fix it if they don't work. Um, but these are more for sort of exploring in the initial exercises. So the very first exercise, just to sort of get started, is just to try and recreate some of the queries you made in the, the first paper. So hopefully, from what I've said, this should be fairly straightforward, but maybe the syntax, you haven't sort of completely memorized it yet. Um, so I think I'll just give you sort of five, ten minutes to, to have a look at that, and then we'll come together again. Uh, if you have finished that before, then of course just sort of move on. Um, and then probably when we get down to sort of exercise six, seven, and eight, uh, I'll actually run some stuff on the screen.
Okay. Any any questions on that so far, or don't sort of know what they what they do? Ooh, okay. What I'll also do actually is provide the links to the slides right now. So if you do want to refer back to particular bits, you can. And is there a particularly effective way for me to do that, Matthias? Oh, good. So if I if I put a link to the slides in in the chat, I could also share it with. Uh, uh, I, I, put, I put already oh, a, a link to the slides. I can see yes, it in the chat. That is the thing, best thing. Oh, okay. Later, put it also on the website. Yes, yeah, just so people can sort of refer to it now. I can do that. Is there anyone working on the exercise if they're sort of completely stuck and just don't know what's up? Because you need access. It's the same link that you should have access on.
this first exercise is really just about like looking at the kind of response you get from Optimade. I don't sort of stress that too much. Just try a few things out, see what makes sense. You don't have to go through and reproduce this table. It's certainly not manually. Yeah, so like looking at things I haven't mentioned in the talk, things like pagination. So how when you get 10 results back and the database tells you there's like a thousand, how you sort of cycle through those, probably a useful thing to look at yourself. Um, so you can see this, this top bullet point on the screen at the moment. Uh, if there are more results, you should find this sort of links subfield that has the next link. And if you click on that, it should just take you to the next page of results. It should be there. At least for self-explanatory. I should have also said there is some, uh, if you get sort of really stuck about, you know, maybe if you're not familiar with Python or, or whatever, there's some example code right at the bottom here in the appendix where you, know, you may be able to sort of borrow some of it and, and use it for some of these queries. Um, I won't sort of talk through this too much. You can have a look if you're interested, but just using a very simple library like requests, which basically just allows us to do gets all the URLs. Get the result back in JSON. That's sort of the most basic kind of file you can use, I guess. Just a simple example where you then loop through the results, different pages. You find that there as well. For the sake of time, I think I'm just going to sort of show you one way of doing this first exercise. Um, so I guess because I sort of told you to in the text that you've been trying out a few different databases and just getting a feel for you know, when you give it this filter, how many results you get back from each database, uh, any sort of slight differences between the responses from databases. Has anyone sort of found anything they weren't expecting or anything that looks wrong or something that was surprising maybe to them about how it worked or everything was smooth sailing? Quick questions. I, I understand what's going on. Yeah, yeah no, sort of you us. So, uh, what's happening is we have that query, and then we make that query for each of these, and then we are setting the number of uh, elements that must exist to one, two, or three, right? Uh, no, so that is a bit misleading. So, the, these n1, n2, n3 are. Uh, maybe I don't actually define that, sorry. They're the number of results for each of these queries. So N1 is the number of results you get for, does it have a group four element? N2 is the number of results for, does it have a binary, right. whatever. Um, yeah, but I don't, sorry, I don't, I don't think I actually define N1, N2. That's kind of from the paper directly. Um, yeah, does that make sense, yeah. And what, was there another question? Um, I was just saying that I tried to remove the any Okay. And it didn't work. So what would be the query for that? Yeah. So, okay. So okay, let me make sure I get this right. So has is a, like a string lookup within a list. So you could say um, elements has C just means is carbon in the list of elements. Um, then we have these sort of different 
almost like subset operators, I guess. So you can do has any, has only, um, get it from memory. Has all, thank you, yeah. Um, but we'll sort of then, yeah, modify that and allow you to provide a whole list of or a set of elements. I'm saying set because this particular field is sort of implicitly a set rather than a list, um, but represented as a JSON array. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can obviously you can change these queries and see what you get back. But I think just to sort of run through a, an example, I guess, uh, I can't remember if I wrote it in the text, but if you actually click on these numbers, it just does the query for you. So you could have just done that. Um, so let's, let's do one. Let's try one that hopefully works. Uh, oh, okay. One, one caveat is the materials cloud is like so many databases in one, but we kind of just picked one. Um, and I did all the numbers up on the, the table. But let's, let's just do materials project, why not? So I've just gone to the link that probably you were making, you were querying yourselves. Again, I'm not sure how legible the actual URL is. Mm -hmm. Has any ideas about how to make that bigger? Then, then let me know. It's quite difficult without ruining my uh, OS, I guess. But you should have seen something like base URL, materials projects, slash structures, and then the filter that is what you written in the exercise. And if I just collapse all these results and look at the metadata, I'm told that there are 30,351 uh, entries that match this query. And oh, anymore. in the table we had, Twenty-seven thousand. So since then, another three thousand structures in Materials Project for that particular query. So hopefully, this is kind of like showing you that these things are in flux. I guess there's new structures being added all the time. Uh, certainly, if I did the same query for Nomad, I'm sure it would be you know ten million or something by now, rather than just three million. It's, it's really is growing at some rate. Um, but I don't want to sort of dwell on this too much. You can just sort of play around with these yourselves. Uh, sorry, the, the query should be performed on the notebook itself, or on oh, the what? Sorry. The query string should be um, run from the notebook itself or from. So you can do it from wherever you want, really. So this first exercise, you can just have a look in your browser, just literally click on the link and view the JSON as you as you get it. I don't um, think so I can show you how to do it in the notebook as well. That's, yeah, yeah. That makes sense, right? well, that's a good point. I kind of, you know, these weren't developed necessarily with Colab in mind initially, so it might be a bit. Checking places. Um, so let's actually open the colab as you, as you say. Do I have the own colab link? So this is exactly the same document just rendered in as a Jupyter notebook. And one way you could execute queries, perhaps just make a code cell under the uh, under the table. And I think this will work. You use a command line using SQL curl just to test it. And go to uh, what's it need? Oops. It's literally manually making the URL. Filter to equals um, just copy and paste this. Let's see how what that does with that. I think curl is available. I think curl up. Do I trust myself? And something happened now. Second here is that So curl works at least, but whatever I've done doesn't work. Um, so this is maybe a good teaching exercise of using the appropriate tool for the job. So, so curl, as I, as I mentioned, if you, if you ran it from the command line, whoops, then it's probably gonna do some smarter kind of escaping of these things. So let's just run it here. Oops. This should fail because my shell is doing stuff. If I put it in single quotes, 
I'm using an illegal format for something. What am I doing here? You look illegal to me. Let me just be able to just run this place to So let's just test getting the first page that built up. Okay, it fills your terminal with junk. You then pipe it through a tool that can pass JSON. So you can see that you are getting back what you're expecting. So, you know, as I was saying, you, you can do that stuff inside the notebook directly using command line tools, but I would recommend following the, the Python code at the bottom of the, in the appendix and trying to sort of play around with your own stuff. So the tool that I would, the library I'd recommend is requests. So you can run the cell that installs requests, but it probably is already installed by default in Colab. And that allows you to use sort of Python's own string handling to make sure it's not sending completely broken results. So I'm going to take the bad request. And I'm just going to wrap it in a, uh, the way you make requests in this particular library. So request.get. And I just press something that's made the screen crazy. So there we go. Pull request is not a standard library thing, it's an external package. This time I get a 200 response. I didn't change anything in that URL. This is just the difference between the way that URLs are handled between these tools. Probably would have made sense if I'd actually saved the result of this. I think I was going to be smart enough, but I can do result equals this dot JSON. It is. Um, that's a handy Python trick if you don't know it, but whatever the, like the last thing that was interpreted by the, the, the prompts, even if you didn't save it, it gets sort of given this temporary variable underscore. It's got a lot of trouble sometimes, especially if you've run something for like six days and you've got to, to save the results, but you still have the interpreter open. Um, so let's have a look at this, this result in Python. I'm gonna import the JSON standard library module, and I'm just gonna do like a, a JSON dump of results. I'm going to indent it. That should be dumps for a string. And it's going to look ugly. So I'm going to print around it. And it should look the same as it did basically in the command line. It's just a big JSON log. So I think, you know, I hope that's sort of instructive at least that you, you, know, you can do this with very simple tools, right? Yeah, sorry. For you said that uh, it was to get all 700 or two, three, and five. So instead of naming every element, is it possible to say you can come to each other? You have to name every element, I'm afraid. Uh, but that's a good question. In fact, I think there is an open issue somewhere where I said six years ago that we should add something like that, and no one else wanted it. <laughs> So the, what, what one thing to bear in mind is that it's uh, having this kind of higher level of, of abstraction for a query, like a domain specific query is really useful. And you know, you could write a tool that if someone asks for three, five semiconductors, it's very easy just to write out the string automatically, right? Of the, the elements, if you know what group three is and group five is. So that would be like a nice tool above the optimate API. But the, the things we standardize have to be things that could be mapped directly to database queries, how things are actually stored in each of these backends. So the common thread here was that people do seem to store element symbols, unsurprisingly. So we should be able to query on those directly. So there's not really any like, you know, we don't expect a server to have to interpret the query that much. They just have to sort of read it and then turn it into a database query. They don't have to understand any sort of extra context about the query. Uh, another question. I haven't uh, uh, read the other exercises, but I wanted to see if it is possible to uh, request for some conditional reason. For example, give me all nickel, cobalt, and chromium uh, configurations that elastic constants are, for example. Yeah, so if, if the database has elastic constants, then sure. Yeah. That's obviously, I mean, sort of goes without saying, right? Um, how you would find the database that has those 
is slightly tricky. So there's not an easy way to sort of query for that information in particular. But if you know that, yeah, okay, let's, let's just do it while we're here. So I think a flow has some elastic constants. So if I was, you know, if I was trying to figure this out myself, I would go to the info structures endpoint of a flow. And I would get a blank screen. I think they have maybe a couple of issues to iron out here. One more chance. Okay, so not a flow. Let's try OQMD. So again, info structures of OQMD. Uh, if they don't have elastic constant, I'm just going to pick something else. So they have, let's say, space group is boring. Let's say, band gap. That's one of the exercises later on is going to be on machine learning of band gaps from OQMD. So you can construct a query just you know for your specific example. Um, what I'll do just for ease is to use my own tool for this. So what did you want? You wanted nickel, chromium. Okay, so we're going to do elements as nickel, cobalt, chromium has any. Uh, and so we're going to chain this thing with another another filter. Uh, and because we've just looked up in the OQMD that they have this field called OQMD band gap, we're told it's the electronic band gap of the structure. Sure. It's an EV, it's going to be a float. So I can apply float queries to it basically. Let's say, and OQMD band gap. Uh, let's just do greater than zero. So there probably won't be many. And this is going to, by default, send a query to every single database. And most of them aren't going to give any results. So you see we're, we're already getting some sort of error messages up here for, uh, okay, so MPDS, for example, doesn't support the any filter construct. That's fine. It's, it's an optional thing. Um, and there's a way of reporting that so that we can, we can see that straight away. Uh, Nomad, unsurprisingly, doesn't support OQMD's band gap because why would they? Uh, and Aflow, Aflow is clearly like having some issue right now, so let's just leave them be. They're returning an empty like like string for everything at the moment. Um, but we seem to be getting some results from other ones. It's taking a bit, a bit of time. We see the OQMD is still paginating through results, and this is really the one we actually want to get results for. So, I mean, I've kind of just sort of run with your question, but this is how you would chain them together. This is how you would do the filter. Um, and you'll probably find in, I think it's exercise. Um, sorry, I'm just getting through exercise. Seven has a specific example on OQMD where they query provider specific things, which I guess is what you're interested in primarily. And also, I mean, there is an A flow example. I'm not sure if it's going to work, I'm afraid, here. But uh, we can query things like prototype structure. Okay, so we, we did get a full response back from the, the client in the end. Uh, again, I didn't save the results in a particularly smart way. And again, unfortunately, something's going wrong with OQMD right now. It, it might be that this is the, the largest number of people to ever use Optimate in one go. <laughs> so we may be. If someone asked me about protecting this API, maybe we've just destroyed them. Um, but thankfully, the OKM, the example, so Abby did sort of cache the results. So if it doesn't work later on, we could just use the ones you can save. Um, so as I say, well, this did work last night. <laughs> maybe don't quite have the scale yet. Okay. And any other questions before maybe I just sort of talk through a few more slides? I guess people maybe have a better feel now for what it is I've been going on about for hours, it feels like. Are there any questions online as well? I don't want to forget you. I don't know who's left online now. Uh, no questions online. Okay. okay, in that case, let's, uh, let me just sort of... The last question. Yeah, sure, sorry. So, the software for its package that we wrote, 
uh, there is no um let's say uh, a tutorial like you see not tutorial uh what is that? Uh, like documentation or documentation yeah, I don't think, yeah. Well, that's a very good question that leads into my, my first slide <laughs> so I, I was just gonna before I sort of got too carried away with showing it to you um is just to introduce this sort of package so I think hopefully this will answer your question um so I should probably stand up again if I can so yeah as I as I was sort of saying before the break um as well as sort of chipping in with some of the specification development, most of my sort of contribution has been uh, helping develop this optimized Python tools package, which uh, primarily Casper and I, so Casper Anderson, formerly of EPFL, uh, now somewhere in Norway, I believe, uh, wrote this thing with a few other people as well, to kind of streamline this whole approach to uh, starting with some structural data in whatever format, turning it into an optimized API and all the sort of middle messy steps that that involves. And it's kind of grown slightly, not out of control, but it, it, it's got a lot of extra features now compared to what it used to, including this client I just showed you, uh, and also the validator, which is maybe less relevant to you guys at the moment. Um, but if you want to have sort of more context on the, the package itself, there's this paper in, in Joss that we wrote, which gives you like a little overview. So the idea is that you should be able to sort of spin up an optimate API with no code, heavy use of quotation marks, uh, or I guess there should be a bit of commas or whatever. Um, there's always gonna be some code involved. In the best case, it's like literally one line to just launch an application uh, as long as your sort of your, your, your data is in the right format to start with. In the worst case, it's several lines, should we say. Um, and some of the, you know, if we, if we get time to do it, some of the sort of final exercises, maybe guide you through how to do, um, how to host your own data with Oxenaid. That's what people are interested in. So people that know what these are, it's built on top of Pydantic and Fast API. We basically describe the Oxenaid specification in code so that you can run a web server that obeys it. Uh, and, and these are the tools we use for it. Some technical stuff about generating schemas that you can then use in other projects. We kind of do that for the, the overall consortium. Um, we have this thing. Can I remember what the acronym is? Are there any computer scientists here? Probably borderline computer scientists. This, this, uh, I think it's an extended DACA Newhouse something recursive grammar format linguistics stuff, EBNF. No one knows this fine because. I don't, um, but it's basically this, this sort of another sort of domain specific language of how you describe the grammar of an optimated query. So that's all sort of uh, described in a machine readable way. And thankfully, there are packages that can read those kind of files and sort of do the hard work for you. So you know, it, it turns this element, sounds whatever, string into a kind of like a, an abstract tree of logical clauses and things and can chain them all together. And that, that is. A hard part of, of developing an optimate API, and I wouldn't recommend anyone else does it because we've done it um, for our particular case. But the, the it's called extended Bacchus now form. What did I say? <laughs> I, I think I said Bauer and Bacchus or something. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably dead. Um, it was very close. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for correcting me. <laughs> you just said, yeah, you got it right. <laughs> yeah. So the, the so what, okay. Once we have this sort of abstract tree, whatever you want to call it, uh, you then have to actually map it to a, a query you would execute in a database engine. So something like you know, MongoDB was popular, probably still is quite popular. Um, Elasticsearch or you know, like SQL or something you're probably more familiar with. Uh, that part is, is probably the most manual part. And as I say, we've sort of done it for MongoDB and Elasticsearch. And this is, yeah, it's probably like the, 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 the rate limiting step of getting more people involved is sort of, we have to do that bit for them. So for something like SQL, well, SQL is actually a really tricky one because the query depends on someone's particular SQL schema and sort of no bad stuff. And we would then have to kind of enforce a SQL schema on people using Optimate to then get it to work. 
unless we expect them to put in loads of extra effort themselves. So long story short, it's slightly trickier. Hopefully if we get more people involved, we can uh, come up with something general. But perhaps the most useful stuff for, for today is that you can map easily to the existing other formats, so more like file format things. So yeah, you can get AC atoms out, you can get Python gen structures out, you can get a CIF file if you want one, you can get PDD files, various other things. Uh, all of these also support some optimized features like um, the custom fields that database providers can serve. So if you did get like an open bang that that will be embedded in the, the sort of the next object you turn it into. It's not just like lost. So that can be quite useful. Uh, the client I've already sort of shown a couple of times. So it's its main feature, I guess, compared to just running something yourself is that it can do these, these queries asynchronously. So again, if you, you sort of know, know Python to that point, it, it, it's probably a bit of work to, to get stuff working asynchronously. And unfortunately, Colab kind of completely destroys all manner of asynchronous things. So it's very, if you care, ask me about it afterwards, it's quite complicated and doesn't seem to work at all. But we have this synchronous mode as well. And it's maybe a good actual and a good demo to show how slow it is to do these things synchronously. So you're waiting for every single database. Well, you're starting at the start of one database, page, 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 blah, 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 blah. Next database, page, 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 page. In asynchronous mode, because the, the way that sort of network requests are, I guess, like offloaded to system calls or some low level library in, in Linux, I guess, whatever code I'm using under the hood, um, those calls are non blocking. So you can send like 100 queries at once and then just wait for the results to come back. And then you just sort of keep pulling them as they come. And it's yeah, much, much faster, basically. So if you're doing anything serious with this, if you end up if you end up wanting to query lots of databases once as part of like a production pipeline, or you just don't want to waste your own time, then I, I would recommend having a play around with that. Um, and yeah, so the actual sort of server side of this, so the, the I guess we call it like the reference implementation of Optimate is in this package. And it's the one that kind of a lot of people just sort of use out of the box. So you know, when I said no code, I mean, you know, Materials Project already uses MongoDB, so they didn't have to do any extra work there. All they really had to do was define a mapping between their existing data model and Optimate, because they helped design Optimate fairly close, unsurprisingly. Um, so if you can define that mapping, then you kind of just have everything for free, as it were. And it's also used as well by Nomad, who, who helped develop the Elasticsearch functionality, which is like a you know, database that's much better at doing sort of big deep searches on, on tens of millions of, of entries. Uh, yeah, my little database uses it, of course, um, including Mapedia and also Materials Cloud. And Materials Cloud is an interesting one because they use AIDA under the hood to actually run their databases. So I don't know if people know about AIDA, but it's this kind of hybrid uh, workflow and framework, very sort of generic thing um, that has, again, sort of built in optimized support uh, to this server. So, yeah, I mentioned validation. Should we get rid of this bit here? I mentioned validation. It's probably not going to be important to you today, but as I said, this is also the library that checks whether if someone's filters actually make sense and checks if the metadata is in the right format. And this thing runs very light. Just keeping errors they never look at. So this is kind of the, the internals, I guess, ish. But when you give it a query, or when you do your visit a URL, what's happening is there is a, there's another acronym, Web Service Gateway. I um, <laughs> ding like a you know a web server basically that, that is accepting requests at that particular URL. And then use a set class API to say, well, this person wants to structure an endpoint. That means I execute this bit of Python code. Um, and so I, I yeah, I didn't really know anything about this kind of stuff at all when I, when I got involved in this. So I'm just sort of explaining it now as maybe it's not maybe a skill set that people from from science is necessary pick up. But it's quite simple, you know, you, there is just a piece of Python code somewhere that gets a URL string and then we just have to tell it what to do with that URL string. 
you know, frameworks and things to make that easier. So basically, when you hit the structures endpoint, it's then talking to this entry collection, which is your database, um, or it's a wrapper around your database. So it could be talking to a MongoDB, it could be talking to whatever, as long as you define the mapping. The, the filter parser bit, I've already spoken about a little bit. So the filter here was elements has sodium. Um, that gets turned into this sort of tree where you have I'm filter, I can give an expression, the expression of cause as this phrase, this comparison phrase, the property comes first. Well, these elements and a set operation on the right hand side that operations has and it has the value of a string of sodium. You know, you kind of have to then turn that into a specific query of your database. So we have a parser then that takes this past filter and returns basically a MongoDB query. Could be anything elements in sodium, but back to a much more simple language. And if you decided that, or if you, if you already had an existing database, that maybe you decided to serve your elements field at the string LNs rather than elements, and there's the whole process as well of being able to map back and forth on the fly. So you're, you're not just mapping the data as it comes out, which obviously you need to do, but you're also mapping the filter on the way in so that the data is specific. your file and and then yeah, sort of the end bit is fine. You just sort of make a JSON object and return it. And that's probably what you're looking at. Hey, I mean, I don't know. Is this pinching at half as five? Is that? Okay. Okay, so I won't, I won't spend too much longer on slides. I'll just like sort of go through on the exercises. And I've already mentioned this over the next few times, so just to give you a bit of context. Um, so as I said, this is where I got, I got involved in on today, through this little database. Uh, some of my PhD work, or some of my PhD group's work, we had a MongoDB that had about so a million or so geometry optimizations in it for various things. And yeah, I mean, I've already sort of spoken about it a little bit, but this idea that we, you know, we never aimed for sort of total coverage across material space because you know, that's difficult. That's a separate research question to what we were interested in. So we ended up with very, very sort of finely sampled particular phase diagrams. Um, and the benefit of Optimate to us as like a small, small data provider, I mean, we were already a small group when we started, um, was that we could yeah, get our results alongside materials projects in places where we knew we had you know, not better results, but somehow a better sampling of that, that space. Um, so yeah, maybe that was, a hundred million, that's right, a hundred, a million geometry optimizations over, let's say, 30 or 40 phase diagrams. So a lot. And what we were able to do is just make a, you know, this is about the limits of my web design UI stuff at the time, I guess. It's just a very simple HTML and written web page that works on top of Optimate. So I just wanted to show this as like a way of saying, you know, if you're maybe your PI or, or someone who, who would tell you not to do this because it's useless, you don't want to just get sort of like JSON responses back, you want to be able to advertise your research. You, know, what, you can just then use Optimate to, to build your own little dashboard, little websites. Um, and I think it, you know, it really does save a lot of the work that you'd have to do anyway. So if, if you wanted to serve Crystal Structure publicly, you would have to go through a lot of the stuff I just said we had to do for Optimate. You'd then be just in your own format and you don't get the benefits of being part of a bigger community, I guess. Um, so as I say, it's currently still this very reduced set of structures because unfortunately no one in the group has picked it up since I left. Uh, but yeah, maybe maybe in the future we'll, we'll do something more with it. And uh, yeah, the, the, the code for the actual the particular implementation of that site is also open source. If you want like a example. Um, so the final few slides I had are about sort of what we're doing next with Optimate. The second time I should probably do that now and just let you sort of do whatever for this in the end. So as I say, we are still developing it. We still have all these monthly meetings. I think I'm stupidly volunteer myself to be you know, sort of like a release manager for the next version. 
So <clears throat> there's still activity on the GitHub repository, I guess, for the, for the specification itself. This isn't including any of the databases, any of the tools. This is just words changing or being added to the specification. Um, so in the next, in the upcoming version, which is hopefully going to be out in the next month, I guess, uh, we've enhanced the way you can describe properties to have much more of a, uh, what to be focused much more on interoperability, I guess. So you can, uh, if you've heard me mention JSON schema before, essentially you can now provide a JSON schema for your optimized API, which allows you to specify you know, things like units and uncertainties and links out to persistent definitions that maybe you've used like an ontology or something. I don't want to talk about that at all, but um, you know, it's, it's this idea of then connecting up to maybe the wider community as well of sort of information centers generally. Uh, we've added a, quite a few new fields that have been driven by things we want to filter on ourselves. So we're kind of worried that someone could turn up and, as I say, give us like a two million atom biomolecular complex thing and we would then just have to have that in all of our queries going forward, which isn't particularly helpful. So we're thinking of adding things like, um, uh, yeah, so some vague description of the domain of, of applicability of that particular structure um, in a way that's that's more easily expressible than sort of making sure that n sites is less than 2 million. Um, things like symmetries as well has been a common thing that people want. So. You know, space groups, but also down to the lower dimension centuries as well. Uh, adding support for sort of trajectories or trajectory style things. So somehow correlated structures. Probably don't want to have a database of know, million Monte Carlo configurations served as structures because then you know, if they're all nearly the same, it's not very useful for people to actually query. Instead, you would put these in the sort of a collection of structures you can access from the like trajectories endpoint. And this could be a way also to drive things like machine learning data sets where you do have correlated sort of snapshots of a particular system. Uh, you'd be able to use trajectories to filter on the, the sort of the global metadata of the trajectory. So what is it in, what elements are in the trajectory, all the stuff we've sort of seen, um, maybe some sort of aggregate properties of the trajectory. And then you could then just page through all the the actual snapshots and use that to generate you know, a particular data set. Um, the next thing is this idea of federated property namespaces. I don't remember why I called it that, but th this idea of basically sharing definitions between databases in a more decentralized way. Um, so maybe all DOT databases get together and say, well, we know what a total energy is, let's all just call it the same thing, and let's announce that to the world. That means we can move a lot faster with some of these things and, and hopefully um, you know, be able to compare real properties like elastic moduli or whatever that was, that was suggested earlier. And also this, you know, it's quite what we've, what we've developed as well, it's quite generic in terms of, you know, you could, you could now just define a new type that has a completely different domain. You could say, do, I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but I don't know, another research object like a sample, experimental sample or something. You could describe it with all the same machinery we've built up. You just choose different fields for the things you filter on. So I think you know there's there's some there's some way we should reach out to these other communities that are trying to do similar things um, in experimental sciences and uh, others. Okay, so I mean this is oh this is what I should have mentioned in the last bit. So uh, Optima Python tools documentation is all on basically on the website. I'll give you the link to that in a second. I guess I'm still developing it for a while. We want to do more stuff with it. We still need more maintainers. So if you want to get involved, just get me up. We'll do a little break. Uh, one thing I'm interested in in particular is this idea of taking like static or archive data and sort of giving it an API sort of post hoc, I guess. So the materials cloud example, they're already kind of doing this where you, you've archived some data with your paper, say, and yeah, I think I mentioned already, you, you describe it with some text, but that text isn't really queryable that easily, certainly not in like a domain specific way. So we'd like to be able to then just serve that data set as, a, as an Oxford API in the same way. Uh, some sort of technical challenges around how we can do that in a, in a way that doesn't cost up loads of hosting. So uh, that's kind of where it's going. 
I mean, they've got more data. All, all the applications I mentioned are going to be driven by getting more data into this, into this consortium. Maybe that more data could be your data. So if you are interested, I mean, I'm around until Thursday, and there's, there's meetings every every month that people are more than welcome to, to come to. But basically, just drop us a drop us a line. There are some sort of some stuff in the pipeline, so. Um, I think I already named dropped the, the, the Metaverse, as, as it's called, this, uh, this work of uh, our shipping arms group at uh, UCSD, I think, it's not UCSD, it's UCSD, um, in the States, where they have applied this M3G net model to combinatorial screening of, I think they call it like all, up to all quaternary structures, and claim that there's something like a million stable structures, according to their model, which you know, really would sort of 10x the number of materials we know about if they all are actually true. I mean, remains to be seen, but yeah, again, I don't see how this would sort of go without having been optimized. Everyone would sort of just have to crowd their database and there'd be a whole mess of, um, of people sort of wrangling different APIs. And in fact, it's also very hard for them to serve 30 million structures with their own custom format because they'll have to come up with one that, that works. Hopefully you've already done that. I don't know if they're actually in this. I should check who was in the participants before advertising so other people's work. But, uh, but a lot of this comes from just constantly badgering people. So if you publish a data set that has some structures in it at some point in the next however many years of funding I have left, you may find an email on your doorstep um, where I will you know, offer kindly to help set these things up because I mean, this is really, you know, it's very much like a grassroots thing where we, we need someone to actually do it. And at the moment, that's kind of me and a few others. Um, so yeah, if you have these sets already, just, just talk to us. I've already mentioned that. So I think that's basically it. Um, I've spoken for way longer than I wanted to. I think you've still got some time to do some more tutorials, if you want. Um, and certainly, you know, sort of going beyond the tutorials, it'd be great if you could integrate it somehow with the stuff you're doing at this workshop already. I don't have any ideas about how to do that, but you might. Um, and I think the, 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 the collab and the, uh, the GitHub repository is obviously not going away. You can obviously keep working on it. Um, and there are some sort of extension tasks that if you should try at home or you want to see that on, just give you a shout. And I think that's my last slide. Oh, of course, acknowledgements. There's loads of us. I'm not going to name everyone. <laughs> You can see the photos. Um, those are the people on the first paper. There'll be some more people on the second paper. Uh, I would highlight the first 17 people on this list are people who are every month developing it for four years. The last 30 or so people on the list are people who came at least once and helped, certainly wouldn't be able to do it without them. Um, and then also Johan, I'll point out, who is sort of on his own at the bottom here because he joined after the first paper and it's been a big big help uh, since starting his postdoc and i'll just thank well, that's the highlight of the first 17. i think my current boss Yamako, who was one of the people who sort of initiated this and has been kind of letting me well, not letting me paying me <laughs> to to do this a bit paying me indirectly i guess and also my my phd supervisor who just sort of let me do whatever which was very helpful <laughs> Okay, and then we're back to where we were. So thank you all for listening and you know any questions for the tutorials just let me. Anything immediately to rise anyone? Yeah. I have a question about the exercise rule where it says um, you could search for binary uh, group three and group five semiconductors. Is it meant that one of the elements is group three and the other is group five? Yes. Yes, yeah. Think about the best way of encoding that, I guess, in the element style experience. Um, 
We're still here, don't worry, we're just going to be broken up. So, some people can hear me again. The, the question about how you would filter which provider to use in the provider and base where it seems way so the base URL, if you look at this, the standard list, let's go into a particular provider. The base URL is like these things that are served, database is served by each other. So most only have one. You would actually provide this as a list. Some of 